Hello everyone, and welcome to Through Time and Clades. My name is Joan. And I'm Albert. Oh, and today um, we're going to be doing something a little bit different for a change. Yeah. This is our first uh, official review of a piece of media where, in that case, we, like, we dedicate a whole episode to mm -hmm. talking about it rather than just a little aside at the beginning of our, our usual episodes. Um, this is going to be my review of the 2021 book, The Dawn of Everything, A New History of Humanity, by David Graeber and David Wengro. Um, but before we jump into that, uh, Albert, how have you been doing? Oh, um, me, I've been all right. Uh, mostly working on stuff, um, I guess, as as uh, previously mentioned. Um, yeah, mostly working on stuff related to finishing my thesis officially. Um, also, things related to trying to find future employment. Uh, lots of fun there. Uh, not not really, but um, that, that's been keeping me busy. Um, and uh, I've also been um, working on reviewing other researchers' papers. Yeah, that's uh, those are a number of things I've been busy with. But um, I've been, you know, personally all right uh, for the most part. Um, just kind of hanging in there and hoping I can get more of these things done sooner rather than later. <laughs> well, it's good to hear. Yeah, I've been uh, I've been hanging in there as well. I mean, the holidays are coming up, and uh, there's all the excitement that comes with that. You know, whether it be you know setting up Thanksgiving with the folks or you know <laughs> doing the Christmas thing. Yeah. Um, but uh, we got some nice nice plans on the horizon. Um, I've recently been in contact with some old friends from high school who I haven't talked to in many years. Um, we had met up a, a couple weeks ago for dinner and caught up, and that was really wonderful. And so we're going to try to do that again uh, next weekend, sort of a, a Friendsgiving sort of thing <laughs> for, for lunch. And I'm definitely looking forward to that. And just been like, uh, you know, keeping up with news and things here and there. Um, my current reads are uh, Sonia Shah's um, The Next Great Migration, which uh, I had read bits and pieces of for uh, humanity of prologue back in the day um i used a lot of her work for the finale episode of that series and uh i was as i had the opportunity to buy a physical copy and actually read it you know cover to cover this time around mm. and I, i've been very pleased with it so far um just the sheer amount of debunking that goes on <laughs> in the book regarding you know anything from immigration to ideas about race to ideas about population biology um it, it's it's really nice and it's really eye-opening in a lot of places and uh, i'm hoping to fin uh, finish that over the next couple of days and uh yeah i've just been enjoying that really um but yeah not not too much else to report on my end um now we, we've been uh preparing some exciting things uh behind the scenes and uh by the end of this episode we'll put out a special announcement that I'm sure a lot of our viewers would be interested in knowing. Mm. So uh, I'm definitely looking forward to sharing that. Um, but let's go on with the review, shall we? Sounds good. So the dawn of everything. So uh, this book was released in the UK first on October 22nd, uh, which is the distributor from which I pre-ordered it back in September. You know, it was one of those things where oh, this book that I'm really excited to read is coming out in another country <laughs> before, you know, the one that I'm currently in. Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't want to waste any time not reading it. So I just put in the time to pre-order it uh, from the UK so that way it could, like, come here before the um, US release. And thankfully, I was able to get my copy several weeks before the US release, which was on November 9th. And let me just say, I wasted no time with this book <laughs> i mean by the first chapter i was so hooked that i was cranking out about a chapter a day mm. um, and my copy is now just littered with underlining <laughs> notes and citations to other books that i had read you know just kind of tying the information in the book together with what i had already known um so i think i can already mention that i really enjoyed this book um otherwise i wouldn't have talked about it so much um you know so much so that i felt it was my duty to write up a review for the show and present it here for everybody. Now, uh, I must state outright that had the dawn of everything come out last year in 2020, you know, prior to the development of my series, Humanity, a Prologue, 
those last couple episodes would have probably been formatted fairly differently. Hmm. Um, that's just kind of how remarkably explosive this book was for me. You know, it, in a lot of ways, it completely changed how I thought about many aspects of the Holocene epoch and the evolution of human societies prior to that. You know, if you think you know about the origins of, say, sedentary societies or agriculture or urbanization or even like the origins of government, you know, uh, this book delivers a fairly strong number of intellectual shocks. Hmm. And the past becomes a far more interesting place, if I may borrow from the summary. So let's jump to the next slide. And uh, before I go deep into my review, I, I think it's important to say a few words about the life and work of the two authors themselves, uh, in case our viewers may not be familiar with them. So the late David Graeber was a sociocultural anthropologist who conducted ethnographic field work in the rural town of Bitapo in Madagascar during the 1990s as a doctoral dissertation, which he eventually wrote at length in his 2007 book, Lost People, Magic and the Legacy of Slavery in Madagascar. There he was concerned with descendant communities of the slave trade, which took place there from the 1550s until the island's annexation by France in 1897. Now, as is usually the case following the abolishment of slavery, things did not get better overnight. Mm. And Graeber arrived actually just two years after a major collective ordeal occurred among the community council that was in the hopes of addressing some robberies in a local town. Um, the community had this ceremony where you drink water mixed with soil from an ancestral tomb, you know, to ensure that the ancestors you know, punish the perpetrators. Um, but in this case, the soil they chose came from the tombs of two different ancestors, the slavers and the enslaved. And, uh, well, that caused major problems mm -hmm. for everyone because even with the abolishment of slavery, those two communities still had different ancestries and associations with that slave trade. And so they, there's not a lot of getting along that was going on there. Now, uh, David Graeber is probably a familiar name if you happen to dabble in anarchism or if you were active in the Occupy movement from 2011 to 2012. And we all remember that. <laughs> um, he was the one who coined the slogan, we are the 99%, actually. Um, well, his activism and his philosophy is readily apparent throughout his work. And, and it seems highly likely that he actually lost his professor position at Yale and was barred from over 20 other American university positions due to it. Mm. Now, despite these setbacks, Graeber remained a big name in anthropology. And you know that you are in for an intellectual challenge whenever you read his books. Now, two of the most familiar, and I have them displayed here, uh, are Debt, The First 5,000 Years, which is from 2011, and it uh, gives a, a new and extensive outline of how our modern system of debt arose through a complex web of changes in community relations, systems of government, and religious belief systems. And then there's Bullshit Jobs, a theory, hmm. which is from 2018. Uh, which he described as, and I quote, a form of paid employment that is so completely pointless, unnecessary, or pernicious that even the employee cannot justify its existence, even though as part of the conditions of employment, the employee feels obliged to pretend that this is not the case. And uh, I'll, I'll leave our viewers to dig into that themselves. Hmm. So then uh, David Wengro is an archaeologist and specializes in the early societies of Africa and Southwest Asia, among other subjects. Uh, he's currently the professor of comparative archaeology at UCL Institute of Archaeology in London, and has published some 62 papers on topics ranging from the ancient Egyptian writing systems to the environmental history of Kurdistan during the latter Holocene to the uh, Bet Yera Pellet, which is an over 4,000-year-old Egyptian relief carving that may provide key details into the origin of elite cultures along the Nile River Valley. And of course, that's just a small sample. Uh, his literary catalog is just as impressive. Uh, shown here are, you know, two of his books as well, uh, including What Makes Civilization? The Ancient Near East and the Future of the West from 2010. 
this serves as an introductory book for you know, what his research has revealed about the origin of cities and kingdoms in both Egypt and Mesopotamia. You know, choosing not just to focus on the great monuments and temples, but also highlight the achievements of the average citizens. Uh, and then there's the origins of monsters, image and cognition in the first age of mechanical reproduction, which is from 2014, uh, which argues, in contrast to previous work by others, that the development of supernatural creatures with parts from many animals, you know, things like uh, um, uh, hydras and, and um, griffins and things like that, uh, those can actually be traced to the origin of cities and elite classes hmm. who managed to spread those images across the world. And, of course, this can reveal interesting details about human cognition in relation to culture. And, of course, uh, we'll have links in the description if you wish to purchase any of the books I've mentioned here. So uh, let's jump to the next slide now. Um, the story behind the dawn of everything ultimately goes back to the work of these two men. Uh, if you look closely at their bibliographies, both in the academic and popular literature, you kind of find the seeds of what would ultimately become this book. Hmm. Uh, given the remarkably unfortunate and sudden death of David Graeber to necrotic pancreatitis uh, in, on September 2nd, 2020, which was just three weeks after the completion of this book, uh, David Wingrow has taken the helm in promoting and discussing it. Um, over 10 years in the making, you know, both authors made sure to publish articles that parallel chapters in the book to various journals, so that way their ideas could at least be out in the academic world for scrutiny. And they also talked with several scholars of different anthropological and historical fields, ensuring that certain details were just right. And some aspects of the book, however, did make it into more open source spheres. Uh, the screenshots on this slide highlight some articles and online videos which discuss themes in the book. And, you know, these are still available. And, of course, we'll also put links to some of them in the description as well. So The Dawn of Everything is very much a book about how to understand the human past. And it's also a book about books. You know, to kind of partially quote Felipe Fernandez Armesto, you know, readers will want to know how it fits or misfits into the existing tradition on the subject. And it effectively works as a counterpoint to a number of big histories that have been written over the years, of which I'm fairly familiar with many of them. Mm -hmm. uh, Graeber and Wengro have the distinction of being anthropologists writing about humanity which is to say that many other authors trying to tackle such large concepts are not particularly specialized in anthropology mm. or even world history, which means that they'll often kind of lack the nuance or uh, miss key details when they make their points. Now, to their credit, some of those authors do have some necessary training, uh, one of the founders of the Big History Project, who I've mentioned before, uh, David Christian, <laughs> a lot of Davids out there, <laughs> um, is at least a, a historian of Russia. And uh, then uh, Yuval Noah Harari of you know, Sapiens mm -hmm. fame, uh, which you know, uh, they're, they're making a, a graphic novel oh. of that book. Wow. Um, and they've already released like two volumes of it. Uh, and I'm just kind of amazed. Like, wow, like the Sapiens has almost become like a brand, right. which is just kind of fun. Um, but yeah, like, you know, he, he is, or at least was trained in medieval and military history. So, you know, like, they are historians, you can say. Um, but when it comes to discussing human prehistory, they often fall very flat. And the problem, according to Graeber and Wengro, is that there's a particularly long-lasting and deeply permeating influence from several Enlightenment-era philosophers in academia, and perhaps everyday life as well, that continues to rear its head whenever authors attempt to tackle the questions of big history. Of course, of relevance here, what are the origins of inequality? And they're mostly talking about, of course, Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Thomas Hobbes, uh, whose writings have essentially boiled down to two basic premises for the history of the world. Um, either 
humanity was originally composed of relatively peaceful, egalitarian hunter-gatherer bands who were corrupted by the agricultural revolution and its subsequent influence on the rise of cities and states, and thus shed off their aboriginal ways to become greedy, self-centered, and violent people hmm. in an unequal authoritarian society. Or the exact opposite, originally humans were greedy, self-centered, violent, and unequal, and it was with the rise of city-states that governments, bureaucracies, and militaries could step in and tame these baser instincts to make us upstanding, law-abiding people who can more easily work together, even if now our notions of inequality have shifted. So, you know, sure, in doing so, we sacrifice our freedoms, but if those freedoms had their way, what's to stop people from immediately turning back into our primal <laughs> selves? Um, so that's kind of what we're dealing with. Now, if you look closely at many of those big histories that I mentioned prior, they almost inevitably fall into one story or the other, with at most some polishing based on newer evidence, as is usually the case with these things. So because of the centuries-long legacy, it feels like some version of either story is true, making any evidence to the contrary seem irrelevant, or at least exceptional to some vague direction of history. And so this is where the dawn of everything steps in. Uh, in a very philosophical manner, Graeber and Wingrow seek to ask not what are the origins of inequality, but where and how did such a discourse come about in the hmm. first place? And is this even the best way to think about the past? And to do so, the authors grab a plethora of information, some newly discovered, some old and forgotten, and some hidden behind paywalls and academic circles to weave together a new perspective, one which makes the human past, again, much more fascinating, but also much more complex and uh, perhaps a lot more accurate too. Um, but to do so first, they had to set up shop in you know, the European Enlightenment to see, as alluded to before, you know, where did this discourse about inequality come from? So if we jump to the next slide. Um, okay, so now what we're going to kind of do is we're kind of going to go by a, a chapter by chapter basis of the book to kind of highlight some key findings and also give my general thoughts and yours as well. Um, so when we hear about the Columbian Exchange, which started when the societies and cultures of Europe and the Americas collided during the end of the 15th century AD and onwards, we're usually told about the process of colonization and how the package of guns, germs, and steel mm. destroyed the lives of the Amerindians. But there was also an intellectual battle that spawned between the peoples involved, which Graeber and Wingrow argue helped influence the European Enlightenment in the first place. So if you go back to the medieval ages, you find that Europeans had no concept of inequality or equality at all, which makes talking about the origins of inequality very difficult. You know, it, it was generally assumed by just about everyone that hierarchies are just part of the natural order, right? You know, everyone is equal under the governance of the king and everyone, including the king, is equal under the eyes of God. Hmm. And uh, yet that included people you know, who were slave, uh, slaves and serfs who did not have the benefits or luxuries that their higher-ups enjoyed. Um, but this was rarely, if ever, questioned. Um, you know, no one would have used the words equal and unequal to describe the situation. You know, it was just the way things were. Hmm. Uh, well, this mentality hopped across the world wherever Europeans went, and that included the Americas. And it's not until the early 17th century that we start to see discussions about inequality. And that's following a lengthy period of contact with Amerindian societies that were very different from European ones. You know, now that Europeans had learned indigenous languages and vice versa, people were having very lengthy discussions about the, the nature of human society. Of relevance to us is what the authors call the indigenous critique. So several Native American individuals, having had the chance to interact and study and even visit um, Europe and, you know, see the lives of European colonists at, you know, at home and abroad, uh, they saw many things that they, you know, to put it bluntly, didn't like. And they said so in the form of these really lengthy critiques. Um, they bluntly pointed out, among other things, you know, 
their lack of personal freedoms, lack of mutual aid, uh, and the use of violence by rulers against their own citizens, and not solely on outside enemies, which had been a norm in you know, the Americas. And it's at this point in the book that we're introduced to Candy Aronk and Lahanshin. So the former was a member and philosopher statesman of the Wendat, or Huron Confederacy, that was in eastern Canada. And the latter was a French aristocrat who was posted in Canada under the army. Uh, following you know, a number of terrible circumstances, uh, Lahanshin returned home to France and wrote a few books about his time in the Americas including Curious Dialogues with a Savage of Good Sense Who Has Traveled. This is back in 1703. Uh, there are a lot of really interesting exchanges between him and uh, Candy Aronk in the book, which is quoted at length at various parts in this chapter. Um, for actually one taste, I have my copy here. Uh, here's a passage given by Candy Aronk that would actually feel right at home in a, a university secular organization. Come on, my brother, don't get up in arms. It's only natural for Christians to have faith in the Holy Scriptures, since from their infancy they've heard so much from them. Still, it is nothing if not reasonable for those born without such precedence, uh, without such prejudice, uh, such as the Wendats, to examine matters more closely. However, having thought long and hard over the course of a decade about what the Jesuits have told us of the life and death of the Son of the Great Spirit, any Wendat could give you 20 reasons against the notion. For myself, I always held that if it were possible that God had lowered his standards sufficiently to come down to earth, he would have done it in full view of everyone, descending in triumph with pomp and majesty, and most publicly. He would have gone from nation to nation performing mighty miracles, thus giving everyone the same laws. Then we would all have had exactly the same religion, uniformly spread and equally known throughout the four corners of the world proving to our descendants from then till 10,000 years into the future the truth of this religion. Instead, there are five or 600 religions, each distinct from the other, of which, according to you, the religion of the French alone is any good, sainted, or true. Huh. Wow. So, you know, wow, right? <laughs> um, yeah, for many decades, it was legitimately assumed that this work, you know, in which Lahontian transcribed several conversations he had with Candy Iraq, um, and like lively debates as well, um, you know, and his issues with European society, you know, people thought that they were actually fabricated by the French writer himself, and just used the Wendat philosopher as a puppet voice for his own personal critiques of Europe. Well, Graeber and Wengro, you know, joining other authors, including those of indigenous descent, which I think is important. Uh, in contrast, argue otherwise. You know, not only were Candy Aronk's comments his own, um, but they were instrumental in shaping what Europeans thought of themselves and of world history. And there was like lively. There were a lot of lively discussions in Europe. There were several plays where you had indigenous characters who were essentially transcribing what you know, actual indigenous people had said about Europe to European audiences. And so, like this was a discussion that was in the air. Um, unfortunately, rather than take those criticisms to heart, some authors, uh, notably the French statesman A.R.J. Turgot, uh, responded to the indigenous critique by arguing that the freedoms and equalities of so-called savages amounted to nothing of importance, because their societies were less evolved than those of Europeans, who had superior technologies and intellectual capabilities. And thus, Amerindians were only free and equal because they were poor. So the progression of society, he argued, is of the utmost necessity, even if some people become impoverished because of it. You know, inequality will always be inevitable. And of course, being a lecturer, Turgot was able to spread these ideas to a wider audience. And eventually, the discourse about European and American societies shifted to one about the human social evolution as a whole, and how different peoples are supposed to go through the same processes of change from hunter-gatherer bands to sedentary tribes and on and on to proper civilization. Hmm. And if this narrative sounds familiar to you, it's because this way of thinking stuck around for a very long time. 
And this is where Hobbes and Rousseau come in and offer their takes on these observations, all ultimately derived from the indigenous critique. So now with our historical foundations in place, Graeber and Wengro then turn their insights uh, into the broader scope of human history. You know, in recognizing and acknowledging this often ignored intellectual discourse among Native Americans and Europeans, which in a lot of, you know, popular books and even, you know, academic circles is usually ignored when talking about the Enlightenment. You know, the Enlightenment is treated as this thing that Europeans just created and brought to the world mm -hmm. without any influence from anybody else. Um, you know, you, you realize that there is no good reason to think that any indigenous group, you know, living now or thousands of years ago, was incapable of the sort of self-conscious political and social philosophy. And you know, thought that is often argued to be just solely the product of Europe. You, you know, humans everywhere, you know, are able to think for themselves and shape their own lives. And this means there is, you know, nothing necessarily inevitable about our current state of affairs. And so for the next nine chapters, the question of how we got to where we are today is explored. Um, and I'll go through those again. Uh, before we do so, Albert, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, not much, and uh, just you know, so we're we're clear. Uh, I I have not read this book, so I'm basically following along as you uh, describe um, what the content is about. Clearly, uh, we've already started out on you know a very much frequently overlooked aspect of history. Um, so uh, yeah, definitely looking forward to see what else they uh, shed light on. Oh, excellent! Yeah, and I will definitely go through as much of that as we can. Um, so, all right, let's jump to the next slide now. Um, so, uh, if you recall, our viewers, uh, from previous episodes of this series, you know, including the update special to Humanity or Prologue, um, there really isn't any solid evidence to suggest that we all lived as nomadic foragers for the majority of our history up until the Holocene. You know, this is a notion that has been challenged before by other researchers since at least the 1980s and probably earlier, if I can find references. Um, you know, and I at least came to be better acquainted with this idea after reading a February 2021 article by uh, anthropologist Manbir Singh called Beyond the Kung, uh, which was a precursor of his March 2021 paper with Luke Glowacki, which is still yet to be officially published. Um, in which they outlined their diverse histories model. So arguing that, you know, human societies were a lot more diverse in the prehistoric past than just this notion of wandering nomads through the through the wilderness, right? Um, and so it's here with chapter three, where Graeber and Wengro offer their take on Pleistocene human social life. Hmm. So right away, they make it clear that the earlier you look into prehistory, the less certain we can be about how people organize themselves. You know, this is why they chose to begin the book, you know, well, if they begin more of their detailed thoughts and observations only 30,000 years ago, we, you know, with the well-documented archaeological record of the Eurasian Ice Age. Now, now, that's not to say that they ignore the previous millennia upon millennia. Uh, on the contrary, they actually offer some constructive thoughts on early Homo sapiens and our relatives. Um, for example, yeah, I, I really appreciate that they took the time to address the fact that our species today is relatively uniform physically, genetically, and cognitively, mm. especially compared to other hominins, which is something that you know can be frustrating to explain to some people who just don't seem to get it mm. or want. Um, and I also thought it was neat how they speculated that the diversity of social organization and cultures might have been extraordinarily different between hominin species. Yeah, because you know, it's always a possibility that Neanderthals or Homo erectus or Homo pharisiensis um, and many others were doing some things that we haven't even really pondered about seriously. Mm -hmm. you now that that is changing, thankfully. And you know, some recent work has been offering intriguing ideas about human prehistory. Um, I've talked before about Tom Higgum's 2021 book, uh, The World Before Us. Uh, where he wrote about, you know, he wrote a suggestion that perhaps Homo sapiens groups, after encountering Neanderthals and, and other hominins, may have actually learned some aspects of tool making 
and a, um, a society from them. Mm. So you know, that cultural communication was happening in both ways, which, you know, tends to occur among societies in recent times. So, you know, why not in the distant past, right? So from here, Graeber and Wengro offer some examples of how late Pleistocene human communities may have organized themselves. And for this, they compare different archaeological sites with ethnographic accounts beyond those that are typically used by other authors, like the uh, the Hadza Bay or the uh, San Bushmen, aka nomadic African foragers, because you know there's a sort of uh, um, train of thought that has been around in a lot of literature where, okay, so humans evolve in Africa, and you know foraging is about as basic a, a, a mode of subsistence as you can get supposedly. And so it thus makes sense that since we lived in Africa for so long before spreading around the world, that our ancestors were probably just like the forager societies in Africa today. So we'll use them as our reference points for like big questions about mm. human evolution. Right. You know, which can be very skewed. So you know, in this case, instead, they looked at peoples as diverse as the Canadian Inuit, uh, the Namiquara of Brazil, and the Lakota of the American Great Plains. Um, and they traced a pattern that they noticed in the archaeological evidence, as well as the ethnographic accounts, in which their societies were organized on a seasonal basis. Uh, so using the Inuit example, uh, the Inuit shift between a nomadic foraging band society led by an authoritarian patriarch during the summer and a sedentary large-scale society inhabiting a wood stone and bone house like the one pictured here um you know where everything was shared and the previously ruling patriarchs actually stepped down from power willingly and so they would go between these two modes of life every year um so while some of this can be explained as a reasonable adaptation to harsh and uh, seasonal extremes you know ethnographic work does show that these changes were all self-conscious and deliberate you know, to quote the book, you know, Inuit lived the way they did because they felt that's how humans ought to live. Mm. So by looking at archaeological sites in Ice Age Europe and knowing how extreme the seasons must have been back then, you know, it seems reasonable to hypothesize that peoples lived in a similar manner. You know, this is what the evidence is suggesting, which, you know, doesn't really make sense to some of the older social evolutionary models, you know. Because here you have peoples moving between two, two different types of societies willingly. You know, you know what, what do you call the Inuit? Are they hmm. a nomadic society? Or are they a sedentary society? Well, you really can't because they practice a bit of both. Um, and so they also looked at some ancient sites like Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, uh, which we talked about in episode 10 of Humanity, a Prologue. Mm -hmm. uh, there I outlined previous interpretations that suggested the giant megaliths represented an early temple. But perhaps this isn't the right way or even the only way of thinking about it. We know from work done on the site that Gobekli Tepe changed form over time. And it seems that people didn't intend to keep this so-called temple around for very long. Uh, so, you know, comparing this site to others across Eurasia as well, you know, including the, um, the, the Sungir burials in Russia, you know, we discussed those in episode nine. So here's one of those famous burials on the screen here, um, they can perhaps be better understood, you know, in the light of this seasonal social change too. And, you know, based on ethnographic accounts, perhaps people got together at certain times of the year and constructed these megalithic sites. And there were people who took on temporary leadership roles, you know, decked out in extravagant gear, only to abandon it all once the weather changed. And in many ways, these changes in status and roles among early peoples was theatrical, you know, in much the same way that more recent societies, including medieval Europe, made theatrics out of government and society during certain times of the season. Um, I think this is really neat to consider. Um, how about you, Albert? Yeah, I would agree. Um, and yeah, I think yet again, this highlights a sort of rather overlooked perspective on human um, history. Um, uh, but, you know, in, in hindsight, it's pretty clear that, yeah, humans are a versatile species and uh, rather diverse in our kind of customs and behaviors. So uh, definitely it uh, shouldn't be a huge surprise that, you know, early humans were so varied in their societal structures. 
Right, and like you know, ha- having the ability to like think about those structures too. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I know in, in a, a lot of accounts, you know, some that take a little bit more of a you know an almost sort of environmental determinist perspective. You know, they, they treat early humans as you know at the mercy of nature. Mm-hmm. Right, climate gets cold; they're forced to you know move away and you know to warmer environments. You know, weather gets warm; you know they're able to spread out. And, you know, they're treated as autonomously as, you know, uh, migratory animals, which means, you know, they're not really thinking about these things. They're they're just kind of robots on the landscape, um, which, you know, doesn't make much sense, especially when you look at this sort of evidence. And so this is kind of like what they, they dive into. So, all right, let's uh, let's go to the next slide and we'll look at chapter four. Um, which is you know, very important for the book hmm. because here it outlines a key model that comes into play in later chapters. And that concerns the three primordial freedoms. So given the inconsistencies in trying to label societies as egalitarian and non-egalitarian, you know, which includes how different cultures actually define value in the first place, uh, Graeber and Wengrow opt to instead examine the concept of free societies or free peoples in a substantive sense in that they were less interested in the right to do something than in the possibility of doing something. So these, these three primordial freedoms are, and I'm going to quote directly here, one, the freedom to abandon one's community, knowing one will be welcomed in faraway lands. Two, the freedom to shift back and forth between social structures, depending on the time of the year, as we mentioned before. And three, the freedom to disobey authorities without consequence. And everywhere the authors have looked in the ethnographic or historical record, they tend to find clear examples of these freedoms being played out in societies of various kinds, even those with recognized leaders. You know, uh, you often hear about, you know, Native American chiefs, right? But if you actually listen to, you know, the accounts by Native Americans about their own societies, you know, right away you find that chiefs have very little authority to, like, make people do things, mm-hmm. you know, or give commands. And a lot of time is spent by, like, the like everybody else just kind of making fun of the chiefs and, and, and <laughs> kind of keeping them in their place, um, which is just kind of hilarious to think about. Yeah. Um, so, like, the key difference here is at various points in human history, you know, leaders and governments acquired the power to prevent these freedoms from taking place so freely. And just why these things happened at all is of course a big question that the book at least tries to address. Um, But the authors do admit there's nothing definitively known. And, uh, you know, right away, I do need to stress the importance of that statement because the authors have said right from the beginning that they are not trying to write a new history of the world. Mm. Um, you know, instead, they're trying to write a new science of world history. Um, it just so happens to follow a sort of world history format where you start from the earliest time and you go forward. Um, so even if the book doesn't provide clear answers immediately, or even at all in some cases, you know, mm. I, I don't think that means it's an incomplete book or that it's completely useless. You know, you, you, they put this work out there and the authors are hoping for others to kind of pick it up and continue it and mm-hmm. talk about it and, and bring some sense into this field. Um, so yeah, you know, moving forward in time to the start of the Holocene, you know, you know, then we're treated to a general observation that communities have experienced a shrinking in overall scale simultaneously with a gradual rise in population numbers. You know, the latter of which we certainly talked about in Humanity of Prologue. You know, the estimated population of the world 12,000 years ago was probably around 2 million people. But just 7,000 years ago, that's moved to 18 million people. Um, and, you know, by shrinking in scale, you know, we're not talking about population density. But rather the total area where a given community resides. Mm-hmm. You know, in areas before European colon- col- colonialism, and seemingly further back in time, based on the evidence at hand, you know, we see vast expanses of territory where different peoples, and this is regardless of language or ethnicity, for example, uh, could move about and meet up with their respective totems or moities, 
Uh, this is a perfect example of the, the second primordial freedom. And the first one, too. Um, but at different points of the world where the environments were particularly resource rich, some communities aligned together and formed new, more sedentary societies. You know, on the show, we talked a little bit about these, you know, uh, uh, Jomon, Japan, uh, the Calusa of Florida, uh, Poverty Point in Louisiana, which is pictured here, um, etc. And in this chapter, like these are all expanded upon in a really fascinating way. Hmm. Um, one of the biggest lessons in this case is that these sorts of forger societies, contrary to what has been written about them, are not as unusual as you might think. You know, they're not anomalies in a world of nomadic foragers. Um, if you dig into the archaeological record, you find that they are far more common than you might suspect, uh, even to the point where the nomadic societies might actually be the outliers in this mm. case. And so lastly, we're treated to the question of property. You know, where did that idea come from? Uh, so contrary to what some popular books will say, hunter-gatherers actually did own property, you know, whether that be material or intellectual. Uh, you know, sometimes these are associated with production and invention, um, and sometimes items are inherited from ancestors. And sometimes hunters return home with a healthy kill, but before doing so, they might keep um, some of the best cuts for themselves mm -hmm. before bringing it back. Uh, so, you know, looking into the distant past, it can be hard to determine how some societies practiced ownership, you know, regardless, you know, uh, regarding items, ideas, or, or land. Um, and an interesting trend that Graber and, uh, Graber and Wengrove point out, however, is the correlation between property and the sacred. So in many traditional societies, there are certain items, you know, things like instruments, or certain areas of the community that are treated as sacred places, uh, to the point where only certain individuals have access to them and others must never get involved. Um, some of the more extreme cases of this are the secret men's cults, where you know, guys get together in a special house or another location you know, when they're not working and just interact with each other and perform particular rituals. Um, and if a woman so much as learns one of these men's secrets or even just sees, like looks at one of the ritual items, the men punish her with gang rape. So, you know, when we think about property in the world today, you know, things like your car or your house or, you know, a precious family heirloom, you know, there is a lot of psychological and philosophical sameness when thinking about sacred items. Mm -hmm. So the authors suggest that it could be possible that our ideas about private property ultimately stem from ritualized sacred items and areas which also go hand in hand with notions of authority and hierarchy. Because remember, not everyone gets to use sacred items in traditional societies, just as not everyone today gets to use, say, your car or your backyard or whatever. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts about that, Albert? Um, I don't have too much to add to that. Um, but yeah, it is a fascinating subject to think about, that's for sure. Uh, and just think about how far back it goes and how universal of a concept it is yeah yeah all right um so let's let's jump to the next slide then uh and, and go to our next chapter um so this focuses on the notion of schismogenesis which was introduced in chapter two but is elaborated upon and put into practice here so simply put schismogenesis describes and i'm going to quote here uh, people's tendency to define themselves against one another. And this is another key concept that's used throughout the book. Uh, you know, that much of the societal and cultural diversity we see in the world today, since at least the start of the Holocene, came about, at least in part, because neighbors saw what each other were doing and decided to base their lives on the exact opposite of the other. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's a very neat idea. And admittedly, it is not original to the book. You know, quite appropriately, they stress that this is traced back to the work of uh, anthropologist Gregory Bateson, who had wrote a paper about this in 1935, where he coined the term in the first place. And so in this chapter, it's used to discuss the history of two so-called culture areas 
of Western North America, here being California and the Pacific Northwest coast. And uh, these are illustrated here on the slide. Now, we did talk at length about the Pacific Northwest, at least, in episode 10 of Humanity of Prologue. But if you need a refresher, you know, here's what Graeber and Wingrow have to say about that. And so I'm going to read a small section here. Uh, the peoples of the Canadian Northwest Coast relied heavily on fishing, and particularly the harvesting of anadromous fish, such as salmon and eulation, uh, which migrate upriver from the sea to spawn as well as a variety of marine mammals, terrestrial plants, and game resources. As we saw a couple of chapters ago, these groups divided their year between very large coastal winter villages, holding ceremonies of great complexity, and in spring and summer, smaller social units that were more pragmatically focused on the provision of food. Expert woodworkers, they also transformed the local conifers, fir, spruce, redwood, yew, and cedar, into a dazzling material culture of carved and painted masks, containers, tribal chests, totem poles, richly decorated houses, and canoes, which ranks among the world's most striking artistic traditions. And so the California culture area, in contrast, and I shall quote again, occupied one of the world's most diverse habitats. They made use of a staggering variety of terrestrial resources, which they managed by careful techniques of burning, clearing, and pruning. The region's Mediterranean climate and tightly compressed topography of mountains, deserts, foothills, river valleys, and coastlines made for a rich assortment of local flora and fauna exchanged at intertribal trade fairs. Most Californians were proficient fishers and hunters, but many also followed an ancient reliance on tree crops, especially nuts and acorns, as staple foods. Their artistic traditions differed from those of the Northwest Coast. House exteriors were generally plain and simple. There was almost nothing similar to the Northwest Coast masks or monumental sculptures that so delight museum curators. Rather, aesthetic activity focused on the weaving of highly patterned baskets used for storing and serving food. Um, but what's most important in this chapter, however, is the types of social organization between the two. So on the Pacific Northwest Coast, there were these boastful aristocratic warriors who ran the show and engaged in intergroup raiding between different nations to take people as slaves. Uh, slavery was widespread in the Pacific Northwest. And in fact, some ethnographic estimates put them at somewhere like a third of the total population. Mm, wow. Um, in California, you know, no one was keeping enslaved peoples and no one had inherited ranks. People treated each other with mostly the same level of dignity and maintained their relationships through the exchange of white tusk shells, which is a type of mollusk. So why should this be? Well, the authors make their case of schismogenesis for them. You know, they looked at the ethnographic literature as well as oral traditions to show how people thought about things like slavery and wealth. And they make the case that the warrior aristocrats of the Pacific Northwest you were know, not able to force their own citizens to do the work that they didn't want to do, owing, of course, the third of the primordial freedoms, they turned instead to taking people outside their communities as slaves. And as this practice spread, eventually in the northern regions of California, the people there caught wind of the practice, realized that only terrible things would occur if they picked it up, and thus rejected that way of life for themselves. And you get a sort of positive feedback loop where these two cultures continuously reject each other's philosophies and mm -hmm. morals until you get, you know, such radically different societies as the Pacific Northwest and California. So, yeah, much like the previous chapter, you know, we also get in the side that will eventually play into other chapters as well. And that's the question of where did domination originate? Mm -hmm. Which means, of course, you know, how did some members of a community come to impose their power over others? You know, while not making any definitive claims again, uh, Graeber and Wengro suggest that domination began at home. You know, they, they link it back to their discussion on the origins of property. You know, we're treated to several ethnographic examples of traditional peoples and their beliefs about keeping pets or fighting and killing enemies. And you get a sense of the spiritual here too. You know, this idea of appropriation of natural entities that are otherwise seen as belonging to the gods or to spirits. You know, people will do this and consider it a form of care and nurture. 
And in the case of slavery and domination, you see a perversion of this idea, which ultimately spread out of the household to become the norm for many societies in later times. I mean, you don't have to look very far in histories of like American slavery, where people get it in their head that, you know, they're keeping people as slaves because they want to care about them, want to give them a good life, hmm. right? Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, and so in, in light of this understanding, you find notions of, you know, equality begin to stem from such unequal situations. You know, in the Pacific Northwest Coast, for example, the commoners began to see themselves as people of equal stature with respect to the aristocrats who were going around fighting wars and bringing home slaves. And so it just kind of picks up from there. Uh, what do you think, Albert? I mean, yeah, that that is so interesting. Just uh, the concept of cultures arising from not wanting to be like other cultures and how that drives you know, so many of these, I guess, systemic kind of occurrences or phenomena. It's yeah, that, that's a that's a really interesting perspective to put on. Yeah, and I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, just kind of based upon what I see in the world around me today. Yeah. Um, I mean, without going too deep into it, um, I have noticed a lot of a, a big tendency in the United States. You have mm -hmm. people looking at their neighbors and saying, "Okay, let's try to be as far away from them as we can." Um, you know, it's up. It's it's opposite day for us, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, it, it's it's a uh, yeah. It's just it's just really fascinating to me. Uh, all right, so let's jump to the next slide. So, material that we covered in episode eleven of Humanity of Prologue, that being agriculture and its impact on human history. Now, admittedly. As far as intellectual challenges are concerned, in my case, uh, you know, these chapters had several material that I was already kind of familiar with, mm. um, even if only partially. But nonetheless, I will admit, it was nice to see it all summarized and explored here, and then some. Um, of course, I refer mostly to the idea that there was no such thing as an agricultural revolution. Mm. You know, this idea that the domestication and farming of crops and animals brought about immediate sociocultural changes to humans wherever it occurred. You know, Graeber and Wengro here go at length about this, explaining how specific species were reared at different times and places, meaning that there were really no such things as, you know, emergent farming packages or the, this idea of core areas of agricultural mm -hmm. origin. Um, and then there's the entire aspect of farming being simply the end of a larger spectrum of environmental modification towards easier sustenance for communities that humans have been doing for at least 90,000 years, if not more. Um, what was really new to me here were the arguments that farming was not necessarily serious business when it first arose, and that people likely didn't start farming because times were tough. You know, this is a common hypothesis hmm. that I remember learning about in school. Um, in a lot of areas of the world, like Eastern North America, you know, where farming arose independently, hunting, fishing, and gathering were still really important aspects of subsistence, often way more than farming ever was. Um, and, you know, there were early societies like those in Southwest and East Asia, where people did uh, what they call flood retreat farming, which is, you know, probably the laziest form of labor that yields fairly lucrative results. Mm. Um, because, you know, you're, you plant your crops near a riverbank and you let nature do all the watering and fertilizing for you. And then at a certain point, you just come and pick up all the goodies. <laughs> um, so elsewhere in this chapter, we're treated to a discussion of Shadal Hoyak in Turkey, um, which is one of the earliest cities, uh, which we opened episode 12 of Community of Prologue on. Um, and we're treated with an exploration of the archaeological evidence that more or less suggests that this proto-city seems to have run without any form of governance and that its uh, citizens, despite occasional problems, lived without any notions of social rank. Now, where things get really interesting is how Chattel Hoyuk is used as a jumping off point to talk about gender roles in prehistory, mm. which is an area of study that doesn't usually get a whole lot of press in mm. you know, your popular history books. Um, but it does have a surprising presence in academia. 
um, just to, to note a, a particularly fascinating part of the book to me, um, the authors introduce an archaeologist, uh, Mariha Gimbutas, who wrote a number of works in the 1960s and 70s that examined finds in Europe and Southwest Asia that suggested a widespread understanding of women's autonomy and ritual priority in Neolithic societies, you know, without any sort of uh, segregation by gender or by value or status between men and women. And that this largely changed during around uh, the, the Bronze Age, uh, around five or 4,000 years ago, as the uh, Yamnaya pastoralists, the, the Indo-European speakers, expanded into these regions and having lived in aristocratic, patriarchal, and warlike cultures, influenced the native social norms in their own image. Um, I was admittedly not familiar with her work, and that's probably because mainstream academia, like, almost totally rejected and suppressed it. Hmm. So much so that when people would mention her name, you know, it was synonymous with, you know, New Age hoo-ha and uh, pseudo-archaeology. Hmm. Um, and this makes it all the more hilarious and ironic, and certainly very sad um, when Graeber and Wengro then go about highlighting recent work in archaeology that seems to confirm or at least add legitimacy to the work of Marie Hacking mm -hmm. um, And you know what? This is an interesting trend in the dawn of everything, you know, where everything old is new again. Um, they bring up these authors from, you know, hundreds of years ago, you know, the early years of anthropology who have been largely forgotten or ignored and they're able to show very fairly that many of their ideas and research had a lot of merit that stands up today. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of actually going through this myself. Uh, right now, I, I'm working through a book by historian Lewis Mumford called uh, The Myth of the Machine, Technics and Human Development, which is from 1966. And yeah, the lo a lot of the language is super dated. And some of the... Uh, mental gymnastics are kind of suspicious mm -hmm. but i mean his arguments for the widespread importance of ritual and creativity in shaping early human societies um, and not say tool use are really fascinating to me um you know in a lot of older literature you'll read that agriculture was probably largely the work of women and graeber and wengro not only agree with this but go even further you know, a lot of the earliest work in science, including pottery making, fiber weaving, uh, the use of medicinal plants, the construction of calendars, and et cetera, and et cetera, was very likely spearheaded by women who had the means to do so because they were never subjugated to the sorts of rigid gender roles that later societies would develop that would prevent their explorations of the world. Hmm. And you know, it, it was a science for science's sake. You know, uh, ladies perform these sorts of experiments as a form of leisure when they weren't aiding in food gathering. And this is tied to a larger series of complex and interconnected changes that the authors actually track through the early history of agriculture, uh, particularly in Southwest Asia. And so here they note key similarities and differences in the archaeological sites in the highland and lowland regions of Southwest Asia. And uh, I have this kind of here. Uh, represented on the slide in this little schematic drawing. Um, so the world of the early farmers, and here I'm going to quote the authors, developed alongside an alternative cultural pattern in the steppe and upland zones of the Fertile Crescent, most clearly distinguished by the building of grand monuments in stone and by a symbolism of male virility and predation that largely excluded female concerns. By contrast, the art and ritual of lowland settlements in the Euphrates and Jordan valleys presents women as co-creators of a distinct form of society, learned through the productive routines of cultivation, herding, and village life, and celebrated by modeling and binding soft materials such as clays or fibers into symbolic forms. So while connected by this you know, extensive system of trade where goods and services were shared, you know, more than any of maintaining social relations than any concerns about resource availability, you know, it may be possible to trace certain key transitions in human cultural life by the clash of these regional cultures, um, one very socially stratified and one fairly egalitarian, which might have maintained their distinctions through this process of schismogenesis. Mm -hmm. 
Um, do you have any thoughts about that, Al? Uh, well, I, I mean, I definitely wasn't familiar with a lot of the concepts that you just went over here. Um, so those are definitely really interesting. But yeah, looking back on it, it definitely makes a lot of sense. Um, and I'll, I'll add, I suppose, that uh, I guess you know the idea of everything old being new again. That's definitely something that um, happens now and then in science. Um, definitely a, a lot of um, interesting ideas that seem fresh or novel um, actually had already been come up with by people in the past and uh, were perhaps overlooked or um, considered um, or considered discredited. Um, and that can be for many reasons. Uh, sometimes people were right for the wrong reasons. At the time, they didn't have enough evidence to support the ideas, whereas later on, people did find uh, sufficient um, support. Uh, other times, it might have been societal reasons. Uh, people didn't you know, or to suppress those ideas for whatever reason. Um, but uh, yeah, it is, uh, it is kind of interesting from a history of science perspective to uh, look at examples like those and just... Uh, you know, see, see the, see some of these old ideas come back around into the limelight again. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, I, I think things are definitely a lot better for it. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. you, you remember the steps to where you come from. Yeah. Even if that means looking at all the things that have been kind of hidden away for many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And, uh, you know, of course, again, it also just goes to just highlighting other voices. Um, right. Cause one thing I definitely was familiar with regarding um, uh, Marie Hagenbutis and uh, others of her school is that, yeah, like there was for a, a, a period of time, like the sort of school of, uh, I don't know what you would call it, feminist or uh, archaeology hmm. um, that was often kind of frowned upon by you know, mainstream uh, archaeologists as kind of being wishful thinking. Hmm. Uh, or like trying to kind of project the present into the past in right. ways that support ideological means. Um, and with, with um, insights like this from the book, you know, it really kind of demonstrates that, you know, like there is often a lot of validity in these sorts of schools of thought simply because oftentimes like that mainstream bias is itself the 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 uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like the the response of you know well-to-do individuals trying to keep the status quo mm -hmm. um, and impose their own sort of uh, ideological ideas, you know, in some sort of like weird philosophical sense. Um, and like this can be a really hard struggle. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've been seeing that a lot. Um, I've been reading uh, Paulette Steve's book. Uh, little chapters from it um the indigenous paleolithic of the western hemisphere and kind of seeing like this laid out very very clearly and very bluntly how like much of western archaeology has actively gone to suppress a lot of indigenous work mm -hmm. on the peopling of the americas and its right. subsequent history that when you actually like look at the evidence presented and and you know read through these papers yourself you find a lot of it is very sound um and it's like this is sort of like elevated and brought to the general public like this stuff will change the way we think and, and research the prehistory of North and South America. Mm -hmm. um, and all of that, you know, much of that is because you're letting other voices and, and individuals, you know, come in and do the work for themselves and, and reveal these biases that have been hidden for so long, um, but like manifest themselves as if like this is the way things actually are, mm -hmm. uh, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, just just incredibly fascinating to me. Um, so okay, let's let's jump to the next slide now and uh, go to our second chapter on agriculture. Um, now th this one is not very long, um, and it it really adds additional details to the story of early farming. Um, in this case, a Graeber and Wengro are concerned with the spread of farming around the world. Um, which has often been portrayed as a steady and strong series of migrations that caused immediate changes to any forager societies encountered, um, which is an image which, you know, we may have contributed a little bit to in episode 11, mm. um, which I recognize now might be slightly misleading. Um, 
So uh, here the authors present several examples of agricultural movements in human history and how the people who were a part of these adventures played very active roles in shaping this mode of subsistence in ways that best suited them. Um, in some cases, like in the expansion of the Austronesian speaking peoples uh, from Taiwan through Southeast Asia and onto the Pacific Islands, you know, the people not only decided to keep a few crops and animals you know, from their earliest experience in agriculture, but other times they often just left the rest behind in their travels, you know, deciding that they didn't really need certain, certain plants. Um, and others, uh, like in the case of uh, Neolithic Europe, among the linear pottery cultures, um, they took up farming only to reject it almost outright later on, you know, choosing instead to kind of abandon cereal farming and focus on the gathering of wild nuts as a main food source, mm -hmm. but then eventually going back to cereal agriculture. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there doesn't really appear to be any straightforward pattern of agricultural use. Um, it was actually very fluid and very malleable, and it didn't always stick around. Uh, in fact, in some cases, it seems people knew about farming and chose not to engage in it. Uh, Graber Wingro actually suggests this back in chapter five. You know, that, you know, the foraging peoples of California and the Pacific Northwest Coast, like, they grew little tiny gardens of, like, tobacco and things for, you know, uh, mainstream use. So, like, they, they knew how to, like, grow crops, um, but they just didn't farm <laughs> because, you know, they, they decided that it wasn't really a worthwhile pursuit based upon, you know, the resources that were already available to them. Um, so which is just kind of funny to think about. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're also treated to more elaboration on play farming and, and how in some societies agriculture was picked up and only used sporadically. Uh, Amazonia, for example, uh, communities had, you know, all the skills necessary to perform farming techniques. And they did use them from time to time, uh, but they never decided to take additional steps in making it a permanent system. Mm -hmm. you know, instead of holding up uh, foraging traditions and balancing them with farming. So let's jump to the next slide now. And, uh, you know, it's during chapter eight where the authors begin to address questions about the earliest cities. Mm -hmm. You know, what were they like? How did they come about? Well, seeing as the myth of the agricultural revolution was shattered, um, you know, is it actually true that there was, you know, that there was an urban revolution that fundamentally changed how people live? Well, I, I think you might know where this is going. Um, <laughs> So in this chapter, Graeber and Wengro focus on the earliest Eurasian city-dwelling cultures. So they, they choose to uh, pick Mesopotamia, uh, the Harappans of the Indus Valley, uh, Neolithic China before the Shang Dynasty, uh, and the scarcely popularized Kukuteni Tripelia culture from Eastern Europe, which uh, you know we tried to give highlight you know on episode twelve. Um, so they all get equal billing in this chapter. And uh, there are many instances where the authors shatter early myths about how the earliest cities were supposed to have run. Mm -hmm. um, so you might have read, for example, you know, city life with hundreds to thousands of people is only possible if there are higher ups running things, you know, leaders, administration, uh, armies of soldiers. And you might think that life in a city automatically meant that social stratification was an inevitability as people struggled to work together. Well, it turns out, you know, those ideas, among many others, were actually not the case at all. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, dealing with the issues of scale, the authors look at the classic example of Dunbar's number. Uh, you might have heard of this. Um, so based on the work of psychologist Robin Dunbar uh, from the 1980s and 90s, which concluded that humans were only capable of maintaining relationships between at most 150 people. Hmm, right. And that, you know, should this number grow, people automatically begin to lose any sort of solidarity or kinship with their peers. You know, this was supposed to be so important to humans that it was argued to be a product of evolutionary biology and that it actually played a role in shaping our cognition you know, to the point where we're supposedly, uh, you know, more naturally drawn to our own family members than to any strangers, right? Well, to put it briefly, there are several problems with this model that Graeber and Wingrow address, including an honestly hilarious observation 
um, which is based, again, on ethnography in both traditional and modern societies, that most people don't really like their own families <laughs> and that this often leads to people moving far away from them mm. because the mere thought of spending your entire life with them sounds terrible. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you've been able to maintain healthy relationships with your family and actually like the idea of spending your lives in close proximity, hey, more power to you. Um, but that might mean you're an outlier in the larger <laughs> picture of human social behaviors. An actual fact, in most foraging and horticultural societies, kinship groups are not composed of biological family members, but are actually amalgamations of different individuals from many far off areas. You know, these relationships are more readily based on specific totems or clans than any you know, idea of a family tree. Um, and if you scale this up to the level of cities, you find that people's minds tend to think this way too. You know, thousands of people live in very close proximity, aren't closely related to each other, and yet think of themselves as members of the, of the same kinship group. You know, they're, they're New Yorkers or they're Londoners, mm. for example. So there's really not a major difference between the large-scale distances of kinship within foraging bands and the large-scale populations of cities beyond the actual scale of the living spaces. So, you know, regarding questions about leadership in early cities, you know, archaeological evidence actually suggests that the earliest cities in Eurasia developed as large scale projects of communal living, where people were united not under any kings or chieftains, but instead on shared beliefs surrounding particular gods or rituals or origin stories. Their locations along major river valleys allowed people from surrounding areas to move into the cities and share in the rich resources and farmland. And the responsibility of maintaining these resources were often taken up by one part of the community at a time so that everybody could pitch in. You know, we find evidence of such systems in relatively recent times. Uh, uh, Graeber and Wengro mentioned the Basques of Northern Spain. Uh, they organized their settlements in circular patterns so that they, they could build more solidarity and keep kind of a cycle of uh, economic aid from like household to household that goes in a big circle. Um, and, you know, most importantly, it actually works, you know, not just in the small scale, but in the large scale too. Um, and, you know, they're kept in check by the entire community, you know, not any royal figurehead. Hmm. Um, and in the case of some Mesopotamian cities, at least, you know, if some people, you know, did appoint themselves as rulers and, you know, kind of threw their weight around in ways that were harmful, what you would find is that massive numbers of the city population would just say no thanks and would leave to continue their lives elsewhere. <laughs> um, there's one really interesting case um, that uh, the authors use in the book um, of the, the Amorite dynasty that was in present day Syria, um, where one of its leaders took over a local city you know, during one of their conquests, um, only for the entire population to reject them so much that when the Babylonians came in to invade them, all the cities were reduced to was nothing more than the royal household and its associated buildings. Wow. Because literally, like, everybody packed up and left. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, nope. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I thought this chapter was particularly compelling. Um, I mean, this understanding that, you know, there was nothing truly fundamental about the earliest cities just kind of flies in the face of what I had previously read. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think, Albert? Yeah, that's um, definitely kind of perception shattering uh, in terms of like the usual portrayal of the subject. Um, yeah, no, that, that, that's all really fascinating. Oh, yeah. Um, and, you know, we, we, we kind of got hints of that mm -hmm. yeah. in Humanity of Prologues, I was explaining. Yeah. It's like uh, uh, um, Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro, like, you know, the, the, the Indus Valley cultures. You know, there is no evidence that anybody ran those cities. Right. Um, similarly, the, um, uh, the Kukwitane Tripelia cultures in Eastern Europe, you know, we find no evidence of people ruling those cities. And I mean, if you see the image, the reconstruction below, you know, these are not exactly like, you know, a little village. You know, this is a, this is like a whole small country right. <laughs> that right. people are living in. Um, and they were able to last for, you know, many hundreds of thousands of years, you know, without any sort of leadership. And in some instances, like, you know, it's, it's possible that leadership stepped in 
and that may have actually led to the demise of many of these mm -hmm. settlements. Um, at least regarding the Kuku and Trapelia cultures, um, which we talked about. Um, th there's a hypothesis that's gone around that, you know, there's evidence of certain buildings arising that suggests that people were trying to step up and, and run the place, and that eventually led to a decline in population where everybody just up and left, and now there's no more Kuku and Trapelia culture. Mm. <laughs> um, which is just interesting to think about. Yeah. Uh, so if we uh, jump to the next slide, um, now we kind of get uh, the exploration of early cities in the pre-Columbian Americas. Um, in this case, we're sticking to Mesoamerica. Um, this section is probably one of the big highlights of the book, um, or at least the one that I've seen many responses to in the various reviews that have come out mm -hmm. for the dawn of everything. Um, you know, especially for its coverage of Teotihuacan, uh, which is this massive city in the Valley of Mexico that stood between uh, 100 BC and 600 AD, which we mentioned briefly in episode 12 of Humanity of Prologue. Now, this site had always been a mystery to archeologists who had no consensus as to what sort of government the city had, how they ran things, and even, you know, who founded the city? Like, you know, what were the ethnicities of the people in Teotihuacan? Um, so, you know, while we only have the barest minimum of written inscriptions, within the city itself, we do have, I mean, one, a rich archeological record, um, and we have other more well-known regions in Mesoamerica that we can compare it to, like the Maya of the Yucatan. Uh, and right away, you find that Teotihuacan lacked a number of key traits that are seen in, you know, other Middle American cities. You know, there were no royal buildings. Uh, you know, there were no courts for the infamous ball game. Uh, there was no artwork depicting warfare of any kind. Um, there's a lack of king's list or ritual calendars. Um, and to date, the search for these things has proven feeble. You know, if the diorama to the left is an indication, you know, Teotihuacan has been laboriously mapped out. Mm. So, you know, if these things are there, then they're hiding really good. <laughs> um, but yeah, to date, no, no sign of them. And, you know, the presence of, you know, these two great pyramids, which you can kind of see in the picture, um, you know, that being of the moon and sun, respectively, um, has often been emphasized. But upon closer inspection, you know, there aren't any traces of royal tombs inside these pyramids. Um, and, like, there's a building that's been called the Tomb of the Feathered Serpent, but it actually lacks burial chambers. Although it appears to have been used for ritual offerings at some point. So, you know, what should really draw the eye instead are these ex extensive plots of communal apartment housing that just dots the entire city. Um, you know, built to house just about everyone without any priorities to rank or status. And they're complete with plastered floors and walls and drainage facilities. Now, one key element of this research concerns the comparison of images, you know, artwork that's been found at sites in both Teotihuacan and the Maya lowlands where, regarding the latter, we do find depictions of seemingly dapper-looking individuals mm -hmm. in clothing um, mm. that is actually seen in artwork of the former, sporting weapons and sitting on thrones. So we have images of, you know, Teotihuacan folks, you know, hanging out in you know, the Maya world. Um, and the authors argue that, based on the comparative evidence here, we're looking at artwork of rulers who resided at Teotihuacan for a time, but seem to have lost any political power there, and so have attempted to influence foreign governments. And, you know, all this brings us to Graeber Wingrow's model for the history of Teotihuacan, which I'll summarize here briefly. So during the old city phase, the city was founded under royal leadership, who organized things under a parish system, who commanded the construction of enormous pyramids, and supervised the practice of ritual killings, that was, you know, fairly typical of Mesoamerican cities. But then by around 300 AD, we enter the new city phase. You know, we find evidence that the various temples were destroyed and ransacked, uh, pyramid construction had ceased, and the ritual killings ended. It turns out that the entire community had said, all right, we're sick of this shit. <laughs> and they completely turned their backs on the royal governance, effectively kicking them out of the city. And it's then that we begin to see the massive construction of all this social housing and the establishment of local demographic uh, assemblies that ran things communally. 
you know, the standard of living was raised significantly and people from the surrounding region started moving in too and establishing trade networks and things were really peachy. Um, unfortunately, things started to decline around 550 AD, but at the moment we do not have specifics. Um, it, it appears that the city declined from within and not as a result of any outside factors. Now on this, um, Graeber and Wengro don't really say much beyond the fact that the entire population seems to have dispersed and that there is an apparent you know, cyclical nature of this sort of demographic change that is noted in many different sites in Mesoamerica, which is interesting. Mm. Now, where I've kind of come in on this, you know, I, I recalled what had been written in other books about archaeology in Mesoamerica. And I know that it had been previously suggested that around 500 AD, at least, there was some form of leadership that established itself in Teotihuacan again, you know, with its own class of nobles residing things, but that between then and 550 AD, the city was actually, you know, burned down, mm. followed by a massive depopulation. So maybe what we're seeing here then is a similar trend in some other early cities around the world. You know, maybe the community, you know, seeing these new leaders show up remembered how bad things were under the old leadership and just decided to up and leave the city for a better life that they could lead themselves. Hmm. Now, I won't spoil much more about this chapter because um, there's some really neat stuff here. Um, well, I'll only say that the authors bring up similar stories of communal living and democracy in Mesoamerica, you know, including that of the lowland Maya during the classic and post-classic periods, um, as well as the city of Tlaxcala, uh, who were neighbors and victims of the Aztec Empire. You know, there's some really neat things there, um, but we should probably move on. Hmm. Um, but uh, Albert, do you have any thoughts? Um, not much, except to say that it's definitely really intriguing, and uh, you know, hopefully I'll get to actually read the book someday and find out more about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, we'll definitely have to, to, to think about that for sure. Um, <laughs> I mean, if you haven't noticed already, folks, uh, I mean, I'm a, I'm a big advocate of this book, and uh, even with summarizing this, I'm leaving out a lot of neat information mm -hmm. um, that y'all just got to dig in for yourselves. It's great. Um, so, okay, then let's let's go to the next uh, next slide, um, and so we get to chapter ten. So we're we're, we're in the home stretch now, um, which is interesting because this is actually the longest chapter in the book, mm -hmm. and admittedly for me it was a bit of a doozy to get through. Uh -huh. um, I think I spent like three days on it. Wow. Um, you know, mostly because the authors go through a lot of examples of proposed early states, and they kind of systematically break down all the evidence we have for their origins. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how they function, what sorts of governments they actually had, and you know, they tie all of this into the preceding framework of the book. So, you know, I kind of had to keep going back and forth between chapters, remembering what they had said about this and that, and you know, putting it all together in my head. Um, but, you know, I think it all works out well enough. You know, Graeber and Wengro are able to make their argument that the origin of the state, you know, as traditionally defined and classified in prior historical and anthropological works, is actually a very muddy issue because those definitions of state do not accurately account for the evidence we have about these societies from 5,000 years ago and onward. You know, it seems in actuality very few of these early states can actually be called states at all because they were each organized on very different lines. Mm -hmm. um, so we mentioned in episode 12 that, you know, so-called early states and modern nation states are fairly different things. Um, but we had mainly tied that to their economies, you know, the former being pre-industrial. And uh, we also gave this definition that, you know, states are societies run by bureaucratic governments, which organize some control over their citizens, you know, while adding the caveat that this is not the only definition. Well, here Graeber and Wengrow state clearly that there is no consensus currently uh, for a definition of what a state actually is. And they kind of go through the whole history of the term's usage and how it was defined and theorized by various authors, you know, before trying to tackle the problem from the ground up and kind of laying out their own three elementary forms of domination that I kind of alluded to earlier. Um, you know, these provide sort of a contrast to the three primordial freedoms. So these are, one, uh, control of violence, you know, the ability of people in power to use force 
however brutal, to get things done or set things straight. Two, control of information, you know, the ability of people in power to dictate which groups of people have access to certain knowledge, but whether that be spiritual or scientific or what have you. Uh, and three, individual charisma. So the ability of people in power to distinguish themselves from everyone else based on a, a, a preconceived reputation. Hmm. Um, so AKA, you know, they had sovereignty, administration, and charismatic vision or politics. So modern nation states today, you know, all share aspects of these three principles and in their institutions. You know, I think that's pretty obvious enough. Um, but when you try to trace that back into history, you know, even as recently as 500 years ago, you'll find that these three do not usually arise in a single package hmm. from the beginning. They actually manifest themselves in different combinations at different times and places. So some of these large scale societies had just one form of domination, others just two. And only rarely did they have three. And this is where the classification of proposed early states begins to fall apart. So uh, the Aztec Triple Alliance, you know, one of the last pre-Columbian societies in Mesoamerica to arise, you know, was more of a, and I quote, confederation of noble families, hmm. you know, that only exercised moderate control of its territories via a system of tribute and taxation to surrounding territories that more or less governed themselves. So thus, it's not a state. Uh, Tawatin Sunyu, the, the, the Inca Empire, right? Uh, Graeber and Wengro are willing to define this as a true state. You know, uh, it had a control of violence, uh, sexual violence mostly. Um, it had a control of knowledge, you know, the use of kipus and recording uh, administrative information. Uh, that was a specialist matter. Not everybody did that. Mm. Um, and it certainly had individual charisma. You know, the, uh, the Sapa Inca was viewed as a god, right? Um, but, you know, at most, it was a state that was in the process of formation. You know, the consolidation of total state power was never 100% absolute, at least not yet. Um, you know, many of these small communities that were a part of the Inca Empire would never really face, like, the direct stamp of rule under the Sapa Inca. Um, at most, they would probably, like, you know, see messengers come in and say, hey, the Sapa Inca wants to do this, and or he'd be paraded around at certain times of the of the year and that's the only time you would ever see him mm -hmm. um, but you know things might have been different had you know pizarro and his crew not showed up um so yeah proper states never you know, never seem to have arisen elsewhere in the americas uh, often because the communities continuously worked to kind of hinder and reject rule by royal leaderships you know we saw this in teotihuacan and i alluded to this regarding the way that you know north american chiefs are kind of picked at by the by the community so if we move to the so-called old world, you know, we find similar issues in defining early societies as states. Um, the kingdoms of Egypt are the only other of the proposed states that might actually be worthy of that title. Hmm. Um, you know, they had a clear control of violence, knowledge, and individual charisma. But everywhere else, it falls flat. Uh, the various Mesopotamian dynasties, you know, they had charismatic leaders, but not in the sense that they claimed to be gods. You know, instead, you know, they spoke for the gods were the only ones that had any actual sovereignty but otherwise the cities that they ruled over were self-governing which sounds like a contradiction doesn't it mm. um so then you got a shang dynasty china uh, which it did not have leaders who claimed total sovereignty um and you know they they could really only give orders you know beyond their little hubs you know everybody else was kind of like left to fend for themselves um the minoans in crete uh, you know, interesting twist to the traditional narrative of early states. Mm. You know, that might actually have been a matriarchal theocracy that was governed by a council of priestesses that did not exercise their power uh, through violence, you know, which is a far cry from any state that I can think of. Mm. Um, so, you know, long story short, you know, while it may be fitting to talk about the rise of kingdoms or empires, finding the origin of the state, you know, in early human history you know, appears to be a bit of a fool's errand you know, if we're using honest definitions about what a state actually is. Mm -hmm. you know, with the evidence we have in some regions lacking more than others, we can see that societies were governing themselves in many diverse ways. And that's better to kind of understand them for their own sake rather than you know, kind of trying to squeeze any preconceived ideas about statehood onto them. Mm -hmm. you know, which I think is totally fair. 
um, you know, it's kind of like trying to argue, um, you're trying to get a definition of what a reptile is mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, and realizing, oh, wait a minute, there's birds that are reptiles too, but, oh, but they don't match this definition. And then you can't, you kind of go back and forth with that. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> that, that, that's always kind of funny to me. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's also an interesting aside in the chapter about the language we use when talking about world history, you know, mainly regarding the various divisions that have been made. You know, you, you think about like the stone, bronze, and iron ages, or you know, you pre-dynastic Egypt, and then the old kingdom and the middle kingdom and so forth. You know, as helpful as these can be in kind of picturing where you are in history, they also kind of tend to skew thinking a little bit. You know, they, they introduce these biases in how we understand the past. You know, if, if you refer to a period of time, for example, as pre-dynastic Egypt, well, then you're going to often end up finding yourself thinking of those societies as living in the process of becoming dynastic, mm -hmm. you know, rather than them as they would have viewed themselves. Right. You know, people live in their lives without knowing in their heads that, you know, they're destined to become, you know, the, the precursors of more interesting things. <laughs> You know, yeah, that's. I, I get that absolutely. Um, yeah, well, what do you think about any of this, Albert? Yeah, um, like I, considering how long the chapter seems to be, I'm sure it's a very complex subject. But I mean, what you've described there it all makes sense to me, and um, I think um, it's uh, perhaps even something of a callback to one of the earliest chapters that you know human societies are complex and diverse and. Uh, I guess uh, it, it would be misleading to paint them all with the same brush, that's for sure. Exactly, yeah. Um, I mean, again, it's like the Inuit. You know, you come up with a definition for hunter-gatherer um, or uh, nomadic hunter-gatherer or sedentary hunter-gatherer, and you're trying, to, you're trying to go kind of plug and play with all these different societies around the world, and mm -hmm. you, know, you, you can't plug Inuit in either box because they cover both of them, but at different times of the year. Right. Um, so... The same seems to be for so-called states as well in, in the early years of, of the human story. So let's jump to the next slide. And you know what? After making it through the majority of the book, chapter 11 presents, you know, one of those instances where the authors return to an earlier discussion mm -hmm. and give it a lot more historical context. Um, in this case, you know, they look back on the indigenous critique and Candy Yerong's life. And they kind of try to provide an understanding of how Eastern North American societies developed their political and philosophical beliefs over time in the first place. And here we're tracing these back over at least 2,000 years or so. And, you know, this is another chapter that I really enjoyed. Um, but I think that, you know, that has much to do with, you know, my general interest in the pre-Columbian Americas to mm -hmm. begin with. So I, I might be a little bit biased here. <laughs> um, so uh, Graeber and Wengro begin with the mound-building Hopewell culture that you might remember us talking about um or more accurately they refer to it as the hopewell interaction sphere you know this is better understood as a large-scale network of clans that maintain diplomatic relations and facilitated trade networks across vast distances so here native americans became used to constant contact with each other and navigated concerns in ways that avoided things like warfare or organized violence you know in many cases they settled disputes through the development of, of different games they would play with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, but by 400 AD, the hopeful interaction sphere vanished from the archaeological record. You know, while its cultural elements, including its philosophical traditions, remained widespread, you know, which makes sense after you know, hundreds of years of societal interaction across hundreds of miles. Mm -hmm. um, and in time, you know, there were regional changes that occurred. You started to see the rise of seasonal clan divisions into more peaceful times during the summer and war times during the winter with separate chiefs for each. But keep in mind that war times still remained largely nonviolent affairs that were maintained through theatrical displays and games. Mm -hmm. um, for example, uh, the invention of Chunky. It's actually kind of fun to read about. So Chunky is a game mm -hmm. where you have kind of like a big flat disc and you have these two teams and the goal is to roll the disc as far as you can and try to chuck sticks and spears mm -hmm. at the disc and like the key is not to hit the disc but get as close as you can to the disc and of course you know, whoever gets the closest wins um 
which that just that sounds like a lot of fun um <laughs> right. but apparently like Tunky was a big deal like hmm. people got so into it that like these huge crowds would show up and they would like they would place bets you know gamble on on the winners and losers and some people would even like sell themselves and their families over to slavery wow <laughs> because they lost their <laughs> they lost their bets um yeah it was a whole thing um but then you know as uh, maize agriculture became more widespread. We see this really recently in North American history. Um, so too did increases in fortified settlements. And you know, that means that, okay, we're starting to see the establishment of royal leadership you know, in these sorts of power vacuums, if you like. And so it's by 800 AD that we get the Mississippian culture, the epicenter of which was Cahokia, which was, uh, if you recall, the largest city in northern north america at the time that uh, my sister gabby had the great pleasure and fortune to actually go and visit hmm. um which is a fun story to think about um i often laugh at her recounting her climbing up the mound because of course the mounds uh, during the time only like the the the, the leaders could live on top of the mounds hmm. nobody was allowed up there and so of course time has passed and they put a little staircase up there that you can go walk and you can kind of see the view from the top and so she would go and do this. And of course, like she's taking the culture and everything, the history. And you'd see like, and she would see like joggers, like meeting on top of the mountain and just hanging out. And like, she would like go to them and be like, you guys realize like you're jogging on like an ancient, like Native American site. And like, oh yeah, we, we do this all the time, every weekend. <laughs> That's great for your legs. <laughs> that just kind of made us all laugh. Right. Um, but yeah. So Cahokia gets a lot of coverage in the book, um, which is neat. Because it's, I mean, it's a fascinating place. You know, there is evidence that the leaders of this and other like cities, you know, things like Moundville, um, you know, they really tried to change things and, you know, taking over this old system of gaming and turning it into a way for the elites to maintain their power. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of consolidating the games from everybody else to like by the decree of them, which is, you know, very limiting. Because, you know, people would come like for Chunky, people mm -hmm. would make their own Chunky discs with like different designs and stuff. Once the, the, the leader stepped in and took over the games, everything became standardized and, and by their wills. Mm. So that, that creativity was lost. And so, you know, self-governing communities were put into constant surveillance. And you started seeing these sorts of mass killings that would take place in public spheres. Um, and warfare intensified and leadership had gotten so out of hand that, you know, in the true passion of the, of the primordial freedoms, people up and left the cities mm. and i mean it it when i say it was bad it was so bad that there are native american oral traditions among the descendants of these communities that basically erased that entire area of the country from their collective memories oh geez um even in the literature like that area is known as the vacant quarter mm. because nobody wanted to live near the mounds um and of course in time you know the communities that that left these cities reestablished themselves in you know, the various nations that were recorded by you know the first European colonists, you know like the Cherokee, for example. Um, while you know vestiges of that earlier time, things like the Natchez or the Lacusa, uh, they remained those sorts of petty kingdoms for uh, long enough to be recorded by European colonists. Um, and so, to the north, in the lands of the Iroquoian speakers, you know like the Wendat and the Haudenosaunee. Um, the people only had limited connections with the wider Hopewell and Mississippian world, but yet they too were inspired by that and underwent their own sort of complicated political histories that, you know, led to the basic understanding about, you know, the warnings of political leadership taken too far and the values of personal autonomy. And so it's by generations of these political upheavals and conflicts, you know, that gives us the origins of Candy Ronk's philosophy you know, among other indigenous individuals hmm. and reading about them in the 17th century with this whole historical context, it begins to make more sense. You know, they understood well that absolute rule was anything but, and they chose to value collective action and mutual aid as good ways of living, which was of course in direct contrast to the Europeans that they would eventually encounter. Um, yeah, do you have any thoughts about that, Albert? Um, nothing much to add, uh, but no, that, that's all really amazing and fascinating. And it's good to, you know, kind of bring this back full circle, as they say. Um, yeah, no, that that's really cool. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, definitely one thing I really appreciate about this book is that, you know, while it's not 
you know, not meant to be like a narrative of world history. Mm -hmm. It kind of feels like how I've thought about world history in recent years, you know, to be more like to make it to make a world history more appropriately a history of the world, you know, mm -hmm. you include all these regions of, of different continents that kind of get sidestepped yeah, in those yeah. traditional books. I mean, I mean, the amount of coverage on like Amerindian societies in this book is just stupendous. Mm -hmm. Whereas like I've seen other like similarly thick world history books where at most the, the, the pre-Columbian societies of the Americas are curious cul-de-sacs of the human story that didn't really do much <laughs> right. in, the, in the grand scheme of things, you know, whatever this grand scheme is supposed to be. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, like that, that was really refreshing here um, to see that. So, okay, let's go to the next slide and uh, we reach our conclusion. Hmm. So, <laughs> you know, this book concludes with a, a number of honest and hard hitting questions about the history of the world and how people have tried to think about it. You know, to get a little personal here, I mean, by looking around at the world today, you know, with all its scientific and medical advancements, you know, the, the vast increases in wealth, um, the decline of warfare and organized violence that, you know, some scholars you know, have attempted to argue mean something, you know, why is it that we have this idea of progress thanks to the spread of so-called Western civilization, you know, where things have gotten so much better than before? when in actuality the ability of european nations to spread these so-called benefits was maintained in the first place by large-scale systems of violence um yeah i mean I, I have heard some people say things like oh well you know was life in the pre-columbian americas really all that peachy you know <laughs> were they actually happy before europeans Ooh. came along and changed things and i'm like you have widespread community disruption and uprooting you got the ecological devastation that certainly followed this demographic decline. Uh, you have the inherently unfair system of treaties and reservations. You know, Native Americans today, you could argue that they're living in a post-apocalyptic world. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, given their enormous history of political change and the understandings they acquired about human well-being that formed the indigenous critique, you know, ways that, you know, many European colonists would readily admit were a lot better than what they had at home. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a whole section in the book dedicated to talking about these sorts of stories of freedom where colonists would get captured by Native American societies or, or wander in the wilderness till they found them and would get adopted into those societies. And when the time came that they were, you know, quote unquote, rescued by other Europeans, they didn't want to go back home because <laughs> things were a lot nicer over there with, with, with the Native Americans. Um, you know, you can easily argue then that the influence of the West has probably made things much worse. Mm. And that, you know, all this talk about progress is kind of like a facade, if mm. you will, or is a red herring. Um, you know, it, it's very easy today to kind of get yourself into a fit of despair over the state of the world. And, yeah. Certainly, the, the news media has done a lot to foster those flames. Um, and, you know, many folks are left with a very basic question. You know, how on earth did we get to the way things are now? You know, that's like a fundamental reason why we do history. Mm -hmm. um, what's different now, you know, what Graeber and Wengro have tried to do and have tried to set in motion with their book, you know, is actually look at the evidence we have of the past to try to actually answer this question where previous authors have only kind of cherry picked or incompletely taken some evidence and crafted their own narratives of the human story, which remember have turned out to be not much different from the accounts of earlier enlightenment writers who had far less evidence to go on. Um, I mean, the sheer volume of work we have today on human history is astounding going back thousands of years mm -hmm. and then some, you know, it, it's not perfect, certainly. You know, there's many obvious gaps in our knowledge, especially the further you go back in time. But, you know, we are in a much better position to dissect things than we ever have before, mm -hmm. you know, especially since academic spheres are finally making space, however slowly, for a far greater diversity of scholars than the typical, you know, well-to-do white guys that have been running these things and writing these accounts for so long. Right. Um, you know, the more we learn about human history and anthropology, the more we realize how creative Homo sapiens is 
when it comes to making the world around us. You know, what Graeber and Wengro have done is lay out the groundwork for, you know, a new science of history that gives autonomy back to prehistoric and indigenous peoples, you know, looks at societies for their own sake rather than trying to fit them into some sort of predetermined framework or theory. And it opens up many possibilities for the future of human affairs. You know, there really is nothing set in stone about the world today. And recognizing that we all have the power to change things for the better, to the benefit of everyone, mm -hmm. is not only wonderful, I mean, it's an accurate reflection of the history of the world. And I, for one, am more than happy to help spread that fact. <laughs> um, so in conclusion, I'm, I'm very happy that such a book as The Dawn of Everything exists. You know, David Graeber and David Wengro have written a heavily sourced, well thought out and highly engaging work. You know, it's honestly started changing how I think about world history and it's opened the door to many other authors and works and research that I very likely wouldn't have come across on my own as well read as I try to be. Um, and, you know, their goal in the book of spurring discussion, discourse and critique is already in full swing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've seen many reviews already where anthropologists and historians and others have talked about the book. They pick it apart in places and they agree or disagree with the subject material, uh, which is great. You know, and a lot of a lot of scholars are like, yeah, this checks out. I'm like this is this is really important stuff that they're putting out there for the public to be able to read. Um, and, and read they are because I mean I'm seeing stories of like bookstores where they they think they've bought too many copies <laughs> of the Dawn of Everything, but then it's like oh it's not enough because they sold out that. Right. <laughs> they have to go and like tell people like oh don't worry we'll get some more and we'll give you some perks, you know for for, for being patient. Um, <laughs> which makes me laugh. Um, unfortunately, uh, I have also seen several cases where people you know, usually still in the process of reading the book, they haven't even finished the whole thing, mm -hmm. um, are starting to take sections of it and share it and share those sections and kind of take things out of context mm -hmm. to make it seem like the authors are saying things that they haven't actually said. Um, and you know what? Shame on you guys. Like, <laughs> you know, that you are a lot better than that. You know, I, I, I do not think that it's a very hard book to understand, mm -hmm. you know, as dense as it is, because it's like 700 pages. Um, you know, even so, you, you do have to put in a little bit more work into it, you know, because there's a lot of, again, there's a lot of recalling of previous chapters that keeps everything relevant to each other, um, which, you know, I think that is a big plus of the book. Um, I, I like it when I'm reading, a, especially like a book as large as this, to keep kind of reminding you, like, oh, hey, remember we talked about this? Hey, remember what, you know, remember that example over here? It, it feels like I'm better recalling things that I've read mm -hmm. than other larger books that just kind of seems like info dumping oh, in right. my head and some of it sticks and some of it doesn't, mm -hmm. um, which is sad because I, I like to try to learn things from what I read. And in this case, like this is one of the few books that I've read in recent years where everything has just soaked. It's like my, my brain was a sponge <laughs> and it was just taking all these things in, which, you know, maybe I, I also kind of helped myself at by actually like writing in the book and, and, and underlining things and, and tying things to other books because you know i wanted to understand what the book was saying mm -hmm. um and you know what i think i i pretty much have and <laughs> yeah it, it it jives with me for sure mm -hmm. um and so yeah like if you're gonna if you're in the process of reading this book and already you're you're, you're raising eyebrows at some of the things that they say just just pace yourself be patient you know get through the book and then if you still have those problems um you know obviously go about and mention it you know that that's the thing that graber and wengro wanted to do with the book you know they want to spur discussions and i think what's particularly nice is that david wengro you know of course again who's who has been left to kind of be this book's sponsor um he's been he's been very cordial with all these different critiques mm -hmm. and being honest and, and letting people know like where sources have come from for example um and, the, and so rather than just kind of like throwing your complaints out into the void, like, you know, don't be afraid to tag him <laughs> and, and, and be like, hey, I had a problem with this. And you will almost certainly get a very well thought out response mm -hmm. an honest response, which, you know, I, I, 
I would like to think there should be more of that in academia, <laughs> right. or at, le at least on social media, at least. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> too much arguing, a lot of arguing back and forth, and, and we're getting nowhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, we don't really have any rating system for <laughs> things like this. Right. This is kind of our first review anyway. Um, I guess if I had to be vague, I mean, a star system that goes from one to 10, I should mm -hmm. say. Um, I mean, I, 10 out of 10, I mean, my, my thumbs up speaks for itself. I think. <laughs> right, you know, this right. is, this is, this is a great book. <laughs> yeah. And I, um, yeah, I, I highly recommend it and it's readily available and copies are selling left and right. And there's a lot of foreign language editions that are coming out slowly mm -hmm. and surely. Like I think, I think the French edition just came out. Um, I think there's an Italian edition already. Um, and there will probably be more, you know, if English isn't your first language and you want to, you want to jump into the conversation too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, like there, there's a, um, there's a mailing list mm. that's come out, um, that I, 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 I've joined where people can like dissect parts of the books and, and meet each other and share their work and continue the conversation. And, you know, like, I think things like that are really great. And, you know, the, the, this field of study is going to be really interesting in the next few years. Um, I can definitely tell that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that that is my review of The Dawn of Everything by David Graeber and David Wengro. Um, I hope you all were able to gain something from this, as I have, and uh, I encourage you to check out the book. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Albert, do you have any kind of closing thoughts? <laughs> well, uh, again, I, I haven't read the book, so I cannot really give an assessment of it myself, but uh, from everything you've told us, um, I think uh, it sounds like a very well-written and valuable collection of um, facts and perspectives and arguments um, about um, human history. And as you said, uh, history is quite an important subject. Uh, you know, as a cliche goes, uh, we don't know where we're going uh, unless we know where we, we've been. And so um, I think it is great that uh, there is um, such a book that brings so many fresh and new um, kind of aspects of history to the fore. Um, uh, if I get the chance, I'll, I'll have to have to check it out as well. Um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> insert a lament about how I don't get to read as many books as I want, but I'm, I'm sure that's a, that's a very relatable feeling. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll definitely put it on the list and keep it in mind. And uh, yeah, this uh, this has been kind of our, our first review. Um, may, maybe we, we might do more in the future, depending on, you know, if uh, we check out other other types of media and feel strongly enough about them. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll see how those go. It's been, it's been fun. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I've really enjoyed this. Um, it's, it's been kind of nice. Like, it, it, it's been a few weeks since I finished the book. And so kind of being able to go back through it and like put all my thoughts on paper and mm -hmm. organize what I wanted to say, yeah. you know, like that, that's been really refreshing for me too. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, what better way to kind of share my thoughts than to put it in a video like this, mm -hmm. you know, cause I mean, I thought about, you know, oh, I could, I could write this down. I could write a whole big review um, and just kind of put all my information in there. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Don't I have like this wonderful medium of sharing information on, on the show with my, with my, with one of my best friends <laughs> talk about the book. It's like, oh, why don't I just do that? And so here we are. Um, <laughs> um, so I think that worked out really great. Um, yeah, definitely. We'll, uh, w without fail, we will put a link to the book mm -hmm. itself. Oh, yeah in the description right. if you want to buy it um and uh I'll, I'll try to remember to get the uk and the us links too mm -hmm. um at, at least um but i mean like if, if if you go to bookstores or if you go online like it's i don't think it's difficult to find um it's already appearing in a bunch of like top 10 <laughs> bestseller lists right um which hey that's great uh, I, I i wish it a long and healthy you know, presence in popular culture yeah. and, and readership. Um, so yeah, speaking of things that are new to Through Time and Clades, we have a special announcement. Um, we had alluded to during our kind of one year anniversary special that we wanted to, you know, expand the show from our usual formats and, uh, and to kind of like play with different ideas. And one idea that we had that we mentioned was that we might be interested in doing interviews mm -hmm. and the question would be okay when would that happen 
Well, if we go to the next slide, mm -hmm. da -da -da -da, we are already in the process of setting that up. So yes, we are going to do our first interview. And we're deciding to open up with a bang because it's going to be a, 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 um, a, a duo on duo interview. So we have Miles Greb and Trey the Explainer. Now, if some of you are familiar with these individuals, you will know that Miles Greb and Trey the Explainer have a podcast, the Plastic Plesiosaur Podcast, where they share various science news and, and thoughts. And they have this fun thing they've been doing where they've been going through each episode of the History Channel show uh, Monster Quest. If some of you remember that, you know, they... They go. They they do deep dives on cryptids and and kind of tell the story of origin for those cryptids and, and and where those myths came from and how most of those cryptids are almost certainly not real animals, <laughs> <laughs> which you know has kind of been like you know it's basically been like my general thoughts too. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something as somebody who like is not really like deep into cryptids, like I, I really enjoy those sequences. And of course, Miles and Trey just go together like peas in a pod. Um, I, I really like their their podcast style and they often have really interesting things to share hmm. um but on their own like they're, they're just as wonderful i mean miles greb is a prolific uh, comic artist and author um he has been behind uh, comics such as after the gold rush uh, and clovis um he's, he's a big dune fan so he's written a, a, a dune comic um among other things and of course trey the explainer uh has the namesake youtube channel where he shares his thoughts on anything from dinosaurs to anthropology to uh, biblical scholarship to pop culture you know you'd be surprised to see a video like you know what are the gems on steven universe based on <laughs> biologically or you know what, what what is the anthropology of game of thrones <laughs> he's got all that kind of stuff um which is just really great which is really great um, oh, and as, as, of course, uh, Miles Greb is also one of the uh, creators of the March for Science, if you have hmm. participated in that. Uh, he was instrumental in getting that together. So, yes, um, we are already in contact. We are going to be interviewing the two of them at some point in December. Uh, we unfortunately do not have a strict date and time just yet. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, Trey's doing the school thing, which, you know, uh, props to him. Um, and so like, he won't be available until later. Um, and so uh, when we get an uh, official date, we will almost certainly let you all know, uh, probably on our Twitter. Um, but if you guys have any questions you would like to ask either or both of them, um, please send them in. Uh, you know what to do. Uh, YouTube comments section, email, Twitter, um, you know, dish them out and... Uh, depending on what kind of time we have and what space we have, we will pass them. We will pass those uh, questions on to them. Mm -hmm. So, oh yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. This is going to be great. Um, we are on Patreon. My sister, Juliet, is of the tier where she gets a shout out. So hey, props to you, Jules. Thank you for your support. Um, and, you know, any and all support is appreciated, even if it's just a buck. You know, It really helps us out. We like to thank our good friends. Henry, of course, is responsible for the wonderfully lyrical the music and Alicia, of course, has given the really nice color scheme for Albert's Alversor Avatar, the AAA. <laughs> and uh, you know, if you are interested in following what we do, you can follow us on Twitter. We are at Time and Clades, where we post general updates to the show. Um, most likely, you are watching us on YouTube, so you can subscribe to our YouTube page through Time and Clades, and you can get uh, your um, announcements about you know when new episodes will be online. As we have mentioned before, if you have any questions for us, we have all the usual things. You have our YouTube comments section. You can send us an email, timeandclades at gmail.com, um, where we will almost certainly try to get to them as much as we can. And of course, we will have uh, the links to the Dawn of Everything books. And uh, with that, that's the end of Through Time and Clades. Um, we thank you all very much for tuning in. And as always, uh, have a wonderful day and take care. Yep. Have a good one, everybody. <laughs>